All right. So welcome. Today we are going to be taking a look at the work done in sprints 90 and 91. So it doesn't look like we have any new team members on the existing teams, but we do have a new team. So I'm just skipping forward to the slide that shows the new, almost there, almost, Whew. there we go. All right, <laughs> um, the Scanbit team. So um, we have a new team on Folio, Scanbit. They're gonna be working on MarkCat along with AtCult. So um, AtCult will focus on the bibliographic records while Scanbit will focus on holdings and authority records. And I just wanted to welcome them and we're excited to have you on the project and looking forward to your demos in the future. I know you won't have anything to show today, um, but I just wanted to welcome the Scambit guys. All right, so um, that's the teams. And so the next piece here is an update on the release timeline for Goldenrod and, and a preview of the release timeline for the upcoming release. Jakob, are you on? Hey guys, yes I am, thank you. Um, so yeah, just a quick update uh, regarding our um, upcoming release, Golden Road. Um, uh, you can review the complete timeline under the link on the slide. Um, uh, the remaining my milestones in, uh, at this point are the um, uh, completion of uh, testing uh, of the release and completing bug fix releases. And that's going to take um, uh, until the 10th of July, basically. Uh, so on the 10th of July, we have the bug fix release deadline, at which point we're, um, well, we're hoping and we're expecting all the, all the modules to be, um, uh, to, be uh, to see bug fix releases. And then the, if, uh, if every go, everything goes according to the plan, uh, the release will be public on the 7th of July. So that's Golden Routes. Okay, do you mind switching to the next slide? Uh, I'll just uh, repeat what I mentioned last time. We have some uh, process changes starting from this quarter, and they will be um, uh, enhanced to the next quarter as well. Uh, if uh, you still haven't caught up with those, that's the link to the, uh, the wiki page about the new release process, which is conducted in JIRA. Uh, and we also have, if you have any questions regarding the, uh, the timeline or the JIRA process, uh, uh, you can always ask Alexi Petrenko, who's the, the release coordinator for Folio, and he's active on the release channel as well, with, where he posts all the announcements. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, and uh, as Kate mentioned, we have a draft uh, timeline, uh, release timeline for Honeysuckle, the next uh, uh, Folio release. Um, uh, and uh, that um, uh, timeline is pretty extensive. It uh, um, covers about two months uh, worth of uh, different release tasks and, and, and activities. Uh, you can review that timeline under this link. Uh, as I mentioned again, it's draft. Uh, it, is, uh, it is likely to change. Uh, the most, um, some select time milestones from that timeline are the uh, API threes. So, by, so that's the date by which we expect that the platform component API ready. So no breaking changes after that, um, uh, that deadline. That's the 21st of August at this point. Uh, and then we have the platform core module release uh, deadline. So we're sort of back to that um, initial approach where we will have uh, a deadline for the platform core and then a deadline for platform complete uh, just, to, uh, just to help um, making that release process more smooth. So that's the 14th of September and then 18th of September is the uh, release deadline and, uh, for all modules, initial release deadline for all modules. Uh, so yeah, uh, go and review the, 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 the release um, uh, milestones uh, and, and in case of any questions, please uh, please be intellectual. Um, all right, thank you, that's, that's all I have. All right, great, thanks Jakob. So the POs have entered um, slides with the highlights. Um, and details of what their teams have been working on, which you can take a look at uh, later if you'd like. Um, but for now, we're just going to jump right into the demos. <clears throat> and it looks like we're starting out with Thunderjet. <clears throat> and 
Alexi. I'll stop sharing. I hope you can see my screen. Mm -hmm. I actually can't see it yet. No, just okay. yet. Dennis, do you have something to say? No, no, you go ahead. Okay, so uh, a little feature implemented by me uh, is uh, seven filters. We have uh, search and sort uh, pane uh, here, like search and filter. Uh, it's in uh, order set. Uh, we come back to order. We come to order lines list. And we have orders. Uh, previously, uh, when you switch uh, over each other, filters will be cleared. Um, so I was working on uh, implementing that seven thing. So if you come back, filters uh, retain. Uh, also, it uh, connects, uh, it concerns uh, search indexes. So let's search by peer number. We can go to another module, uh, come back to the orders, and uh, yep, that's uh, one feature. Thanks. I think Andre can continue. Okay, hello. I can uh, proceed. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it. Uh, yes. Thank you. I'm going to demonstrate uh, two new features in uh, orders uh, and receiving apps. Uh, the first setup is about uh, connection between peer lines and uh, agreements. So to see how it uh, works, so let's go to agreements, uh, select uh, one of them that I have prepared for demo. It's demo agreement. Let's go to edit. And here we can see that uh, we have agreement with uh, one agreement lines and uh, we can uh, connect our peer line to this agreement line. So we need to find it and click save. Uh, now we need to go to orders. And here, here we can see our peer line. And if we go to details, uh, we'll see that uh, new accordion related agreement lines is appeared. And here we can see agreement lines information that uh, is connected to our PO line. Uh, clicking on uh, the name of agreement, we will see details of agreement. Uh, the next one is uh, related to select locations during creating, creating pieces. Uh, now a um, list of locations uh, for um, creation and editing piece is based on uh, PL line locations. So here we see, we can see that uh, PL line locations is presented to two of them. It's uh, main library and annex. And if we go to receiving, and uh, click uh, on uh, add piece. Uh, here we can see from uh, the Dropbox uh, two locations from PL line. But uh, I, for some, if uh, user need for some reasons to change it and add uh, a new location that is not presented in um, the list, uh, he can uh, click on assign a different location and uh, from the plugin select uh, any of location. So uh, as the same, we can, uh, we can do the, the when uh, on the on receiving screen. So here we can see three locations, uh, two from PO line and uh, one that we edit uh, during creation. And uh, here we can select one of them or select uh, any from uh, the plugin. So we can receive this piece and uh, see that uh, it works. That's all I have uh, for this demo. Thank you. Thank you. Looks good. Okay, so uh, next we have Firebird with Steph. Hi everyone. 
So uh, Firebird has started working on moving holdings and items in inventory. Um, and we've just started the work in the last few sprints. So today we are going to be able to show you moving items to a different holding within the same instance. And Vlad will take us through that. Yep, hello, I'll share my screen. Mm. I hope you can see it. Yep. Yes. yes. Great. Um, to show uh, our new feature, part of our new feature, we need to open uh, some details instance. And in action menu, uh, we can see move items within an instance uh, item, which will activate our drag and drop mod. In this mod, we can see uh, drag and drop icons uh, to move any item and check boxes to choose few items uh, to move them in one time. For example, we choose um, both of them and move it. And during the moving, you can see that we uh, know uh, how many items are we moving. And after um, all items have been moved, uh, we can see success message and also we can uh, move only one item. And uh, when we finish with uh, this moving actions, we can uh, turn off this mod by clicking in action menu, stop items movement within an instance. Uh, that's me, thank you. That was really cool, thanks for sharing. All right. Um, so yeah, and I guess, um, Steph, you're going to do the intro for Concord since Magda's out. Yes, Magda can't be here with us today. So in the last two sprints, the Concord team has added support for several mark fields and records generated on the fly. Um, also, the mapping rules are now tenant specific and the data export mapping profile supports um, transformation for selected fields from holdings and items and those fields can be appended during the export to mark BIP records. Uh, the mapping profile can be associated with the export job through job profile through a job profile that users select while triggering the export and they also fixed a few bugs and worked on releasing modules so they have been very very busy. Um, Victor will start, followed by Ilya and then Andre. Yes, hi guys. So let me share my screen. So um, first of all, uh, I'm going to present you with uh, the latest uh, updates uh, to data export application. And first of all, let's navigate to the settings uh, of data export and particularly uh, create new mapping profile page. Uh, last time uh, we were presenting you with uh, transformations UI, which were not baked with the backend, but uh, uh, today we have support as it supports. So uh, here we can uh, fill a transformation values for fields and they will be processed during the export. Also we have now possibility to have the uh, navigate to particular details for the given mapping profiles where, where we can see information about uh, summary fields uh, and uh, actually data which user uh, has been uh, filled during the profile creation with uh, standard metadata uh, about when it uh, has been created or updated. So in case if we I have not filled any transformation values, we would end up with empty list here. The same uh, goes for job profiles. So we also have possibility to uh, look at the de uh, navigate details page for the given job profile. And this is where we can also see the information of the linked uh, mapping profiles, which were chosen uh, upon creation. So uh, that's all for settings. And uh, let's now navigate to a data export uh, landing page. We, previously, we uh, presented you with 
uh, the flow when uh, during the export uh, we were using internally the default job profile um, so we were not having uh, any step for uh, creating a custom created one so now we have that step so let's uh, initiate the export by uh, selecting UIDs and this time we will navigate to the jo choose job profile page where we can see uh, all the job profiles which has been created so far we can see the details for each one and uh, if we click cancel of course we can cancel this stuff and uh, and uh, also please pay attention that we can see the details of what the actual uh, job profile it is and also we can hit eventually run to initiate the export process and uh, uh, this time uh, we end up as you can see uh, with some uh, running job um, entry for a moment where we also have a few updates on the process uh, about details uh, about the progress information so when it takes one time we can see the progress indicator uh, which we have now similar actually to data import so and here we can see uh, the final work details uh, and we can see the job is successful uh, also i would like to mention that uh, job profiles and mapping profiles allows uh, the user to have the uh, same transformations for different data sets or the uh, the same data set for different transformation and uh, more about transformation uh, Ilya will present right after me so and this is all from my side if you have any questions please address them thank you okay hi everyone I'm Ilya from Concord uh, let me share my screen Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. Um, my demo contains two parts. The first one includes uh, generating MarkB record on the fly using a uh, specific mapping profile transformation uh, for holding an item records. Uh, at the same time, I'll show three new fields. Uh, for instance, uh, records uh, that we added uh, and um, to added to default rules. And the second part uh, includes the functionality of appending mapping profile transformations, the same for holding in item two uh, instances with underlying SRS records. So let's start. Uh, firstly, I would like to show you a prepared transformation list. Uh, so it, this list contains all uh, transformations that we released in Q2. Uh, each of uh, transformation contains uh, the name and transformation value. Transformation value contains the part of uh, mark uh, ID or tag uh, indicators. Um, you can see that most of the indicators are blank uh, and just, for example, 903 has uh, two F and subfield. Um, so I, I think it's all about transformations. And uh, I also prepared some uh, instances records with necessary field values. Uh, so let's look, let's look on uh, one instance that I'm going to use during the export. Uh, yeah, the first, the first thing that I want to show, uh, it's new, three new fields for instance. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, uh, form category, form term and third one, it's, um, text. It's, uh, like, uh, instance, uh, type ID. Uh, now let's look on holdings assigned to this instance. So you can see that it contains permanent and temporary allocation. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention one thing that in case if uh, permanent location and temporary locations 
have the same transformation values. In this case, we just add temporary location. So I cover this case um, and uh, same time this holding record contains call number prefix, call, call number, call number suffix. Uh, and also it contains uh, electronic access URI and electronic access link text. Now let's look on items I signed to this holding. Uh, they are pretty similar. So into uh, what what I interest in for us, it's uh, material type, it's book, uh, effective call number. So you can see it's goes from holding effective location for item and uh, also electronic access URI and electronic access link text. Let's check second uh, item, fill a record uh, and you can see that it has pretty the same values for material type, for effective location ID and so on, and uh, for electronic access. Uh, so, and now let's, uh, let's upload CSV file, this UAD of this uh, instance. So let's go to data export tab and choose a file this one. Uh, let's choose transformation, map and profile transformation, or oh, drop profile, sorry. So, uh, okay, seems it's finished. So quick. Uh, I'm saving um, generated MRC file. And now I'm going to use mark edit tool to verify the content. Oh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong tool. Yeah, this one. I, I'm opening necessary new generated MRC file. So let's validate it using tool validate. Okay, and you can see that no errors were reported. And uh, now let's look on some field uh, values. So the uh, three fields um, that I um, was talking about, it's the first it's text value, this text value, it's instance type ID. Then uh, you can see format uh, ID and uh, format categories. It's three fields, 336, 337 and 338. And then you, you can see the, this uh, field generated by transformation values. And one important thing uh, to show you, uh, you can see, for example, that call number and prefix and suffix uh, has the same ID value. In this case, all these values uh, are combined in one field with different subfields. So, and the same thing you can see here. The same story for uh, electronic access. So then you can see just one temporary location uh, without permanent. Uh, as far as they, these transformations for these locations have the same values. Uh, then you can see uh, values for items files we have two items unsigned to one holding in one instance, then you can see that we have uh, uh, kind of duplicate values. Uh, so I think uh, it's all regarding the first part. Uh, let me mm, show the second one. If you don't have any question now, you can continue. Uh, so the second uh, record that I prepared has other UAD and the difference that source of those records is Mark. In, if you look on the source of uh, this uh, record, yeah, it's folio, but we need uh, 
are the one to have uh, instance with underlying SRS records. So yeah, you can see it's source mark and uh, it also contains holding uh, with permanent location, temporary location with uh, electronic access and um, and this call number, sure. Uh, and it contains one item, but uh, without barcode. Uh, but it uh, contains material type, uh, effective call number, effective location, and the last thing it's electronic access. So, so now let's uh, do export with this instance. Uh, I with ID of this instance record. So now I choose a uh, CSV file for SRS. Again, I choose the same job profile with the same assigned mapping profile. Okay, and I think seems uh, export is finished. Let's download generated, well, not generated, but MRC file, yeah. Uh, now let's open it uh, using mark edit tool. So this one, you can see it contains more fields in general. Let's validate it firstly to be sure that it's correct. Yeah, and again, you can see that no errors were reported. Uh, and uh, here, um, all all fields, uh, most of the fields uh, we have from SRS record, but just uh, this 900, 900, uh, one, two, three, four, and five and six uh, generated by mapping profiles. And uh, you can see pretty the same um, field values. Uh, the same story about um, temporary and permanent location, but uh, you can see uh, that as far as we have just one item a record, uh, we don't have some mm, double values here mm, for specific item fields. Uh, so I think that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have some questions, please ask. Hello, everyone. Hello. Please let me know if you see, can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is Andrei Namiski from Concord, and today I'm going to show you uh, how to create a tenant-specific mapping rules uh, uh, for generating mark records on the fly in configuration model that will be used instead of, at a, instead of default data export rules. So let's just export some uh, file with one UID. <coughs> just to compare the results later. Choose the folder profile. And as you can see, file contains a lot of fields. Now let's create a specific rules. Uh, I took two, two rules from our default rules for the first field and 245 and use online JSON to string converter to convert it to string. The result will be used for creating uh, configuration. Uh, we can use some application, for example, Postman to create rules, to override rules. So let's uh, post, uh, let's put our rules to the value field enabled field should be true and code should be rules override. So let's create the rules. Yeah, it's successfully created. And now let's export the same file as we exported one minute ago. And compare the result. 
And as you can see, uh, mark file contains only the first field and 245. So during the export process, uh, our specific rules was used. That's all from my side. Thank you. Please let me know if you have any questions. Wow, thanks guys. That was a lot of progress. It's looking really good. Okay, so that's Concord. So I guess Spitfire is up next and Khalil is gonna start them off. Hey everyone. Um, so um, we're going to first demo uh, some of the updates we've made around custom fields. Um, and then talk about uh, the new field we added to the user record called preferred first name um, and also discuss some of the changes you'll see with the, the user record um, when we did implement that update. And then um, we'll wrap up with uh, uh, showing you the work we've done around storing multiple KBs in a single tenant. Uh, this functionality will allow uh, schools or, or consortia like five colleges to uh, use Folio for ERM. And the person who is going to show all of this wonderful work that the Spitfire team has done is Dennis. So Dennis, uh, take it away. Mm, thank you, Kalila. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, okay, so... Uh, Disappeared. Mm. Yeah, so I'm going to start off with uh, custom fields. So we have added uh, two custom field types, uh, which is uh, uh, multi select and radio button set. Um, so multi select is basically uh, like a single select, but um, a user is able to select uh, several values from it. Um, and radio button set uh, basically lets you to lets you select a single value out of um, a list of um, available values which was uh, created. Um, yeah, so uh, I have prepared uh, two custom fields, uh, major and is working from home, and now I'm going to show you how it looks. So on the user record, we can see that major and is working from home. Um, don't have uh, values um, and um, is working from home has a default value of no so this is why it says no and um, if we go to edit page and um, like select a couple of values here and change this value and save then uh, this should update Yep, and you can see that uh, the major and working from home fields have updated with the values that um, I've, I've just uh, set. Um, yep, and this uh, works basically the same uh, when created uh, when creating a user. Um, yep, so uh, the same fields here. Um, so that's all uh, for custom fields. Um, now I'm going to uh, switch to uh, preferred uh, preferred uh, name, um, preferred first name. So you can see on this record we have uh, a new field uh, which is uh, preferred uh, first name, uh, which basically lets user to uh, add uh, whatever it is that uh, they are preferred to um, be called. Um, so let me start off, um, off with editing like um, some. Uh, characters, uh, numerals, and uh, emojis, even. Um, and it'll take, yeah, one second. Um, you can see that uh, the field uh, has been updated. And for another example, I've chosen um, yeah, Elon Musk's son's name. So that should work fine as well. Um, Yep, here it is. And if we refresh the page, it should stay saved. Yep, here it is. Um, so I guess that's all uh, regarding 
preferred first name, and I'm going to switch uh, to single tenant uh, multiple KBs. Um, so we have um, made uh, some changes to holding settings. So now um, you can see uh, instead of um, uh, just uh, a single uh, a single knowledge base with settings, uh, you can see that we have um, well, right now we have uh, only one knowledge base because it has been configured. But um, when you configure uh, several knowledge bases, they'll be shown here as a list. So let me show you how it's done. Um, I'm going to. Um, select a configuration. I hope the credentials are correct. Um, yep, you can see that uh, I have created uh, a second knowledge base with these credentials, but, um, and uh, you can see that now instead of one knowledge base, one knowledge base settings, we have a list, a list of knowledge bases with um, related settings. Um, and all of these settings are um, basically related to a single knowledge base. So um, as you can see that we have a um, access status types of subscription and trial in this, in the first knowledge base, but uh, no access status types in the second one. Um, so let me switch to another environment uh, where we have uh, set up uh, a couple more knowledge bases. Um, so yeah, um, uh, now let me talk about, a little about, about um, uh, access. So the way it works is uh, if you have a single knowledge base then, and no users has, have been assigned in this assigned users uh, view, then um, all users have uh, access to e holdings application. If uh, one or more users have been assigned, then only those users who have uh, access to e holdings applications. And uh, if there's uh, um, two or more knowledge bases, then uh, you basically have to assign assign users to each of them um, because, um, well, um, it's difficult to kind of uh, figure out uh, which users uh, are assigned to which uh, knowledge base. So here we have uh, two knowledge bases. Uh, the first one has assigned user uh, rows uh, with this account I'm currently logged in. And a second knowledge base doesn't have any users assigned. Um, so let me log in as a different user. Um, refresh the page. And yeah, so I am logged in as um, Sophia. And as you can see, I'm uh, in a holdings application and I'm shown an error message that uh, you don't have uh, permissions to a holdings application, uh, holdings application, please contact your administrator. So now if I add um, mm, that's all, let me refresh the page. For some reason, I didn't see the button to assign. Yeah, here it is. Um, so let me add Sophia. Um, so, and if I now switch back and refresh the page, I should probably also reload again. Oh, yeah, so it works. Um, and uh, Sophia has been added as an assigned user to a knowledge base, and now she has access to um, basically packages and uh, all, all of the stuff that is related to that knowledge base. And we can check that uh, by looking at the, for example, access status types. So we have, um, uh, how many, that's seven access status types um, compared to only four in the first knowledge base. So now if we um, 
search packages and select access that types filters, we should see seven types. And um, yeah, we do. Um, I think that's probably all uh, regarding single tenant multiple kbs. So if you have any questions, please ask. I'll be happy to answer. Um, thank you. Nice work, you guys. Looks good. So let's see. The next up for demos is lost my place here. Um, Vega with Alex. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Tell me when you see it. I see it. Okay, so today I would like to show you the new feature we've been working on for a while now, automated patron blocks. It can be found in the user section of the settings right here. Now, automated patron blocks allow you to set up um, blocks on per patron group basis. We have introduced a new module, mod patron blocks, which is responsible for managing two new entities, which are in the heart of this feature, conditions, and limits. Now conditions, uh, they define a set of actions which should be blocked, these actions which should be blocked when a certain limit is reached. Currently we have six uh, conditions set up. Now this list is predefined and cannot be changed through user interface and as you can see all conditions basically have the same set of settings. And uh, now limits uh, limits are configured on a per patron group basis and they define specific values for conditions. As you can see, this list is exactly the list of conditions we've seen before. Now, once a user, a patron, reaches a certain limit configured for a patron group, like say we have maximum number of items charged out for a patron which is member of demo group set to two. Once this limit uh, is reached and actions configured in uh, condition uh, should be blocked. And let me show you how it works. So at the moment we have one condition configured. This is maximum numbers of items um, checked out. And once the limit for this condition is reached, uh, these two, three actions, borrowings, borrowings, renewals, and requests uh, should be blocked. And we have configured the limit for this condition uh, for demo group to two. Now the way it works, I have a user, which is the member of this demo group. And let's try and check out a few items for this user. So this is one, checked out, this is two. Now at this point, we have already reached uh, the limit of um, checked out items for this user. So the next checkout should be blocked. Yeah, as you can see, it says that the limit maximum number of items charged out is reached. Now, if you go to the user details page for this user, there's a list of patron blocks, which uh, reflects all the blocks um, that exist for this particular user. Now, if we go back to settings, change the limit to say three, Go back to the user page, refresh. You can see that the limit is gone. Now let's change it back to two. And now um, this block right now works for checkouts, which we've seen a minute ago. Also, it should be applied to to renewals. So if we try it and renew uh, the loan open for this user, we should get a similar message. See, the renewal is uh, blocked for the same reason. 
And also this block should apply to requests. So if we try and create a new request for this user, Yeah, and again, we get a warning that the limit was reached, so the requests are blocked. Now, if I try and save this request, again, I get the same message. So, um, the rest of the blocks, they work in a similar fashion. We're still um, polishing and fine tuning some of them. But once this work is complete, they're going to be a great addition to Folio's toolkit. And that's it for today. Thank you. If you have any questions, shoot. Thanks, Alex. I agree. This is a great addition to Folio. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is Core Functional with Bogdan. Bogdan's going to demo some declared lost workflows. I should mention that Core Functional also fixed 29 bugs and released 29 modules for the past couple of sprints. So I've been busy with that stuff as well. Yeah, hi guys. So today I'm, I'm going to show you um, declared lost features. Um, uh, we now, as you know, we're now assigning um, declared lost uh, fees and files automatically, and yeah, and uh, the first feature is about uh, clothing uh, declared lost loan. Once all the uh, lost fees and fines are resolved, for example, by uh, canceling them or by paying, transferring, or waiving. Okay, so okay, I have. Uh, a declared loss loan, and there is, as you can see, there is some fine assigned. Um, let's take a look at the fees and fines page. So yeah, here hey, you can uh, see that we have lost item processing fee and lost item fee. Um, so we can, uh, for example, pay processing fee, confirm, and uh, example transfer the lost item fee. Confirm. Okay, and uh, now if we check the loan, this loan should be closed. Yeah. So here you can see that uh, closed loan action uh, action created, and um, the item itself should be should have lost and paid status okay. yeah and uh, important thing uh, here that uh, this um, um, resolving of fees and fines and uh, closing the law one happens asynchronously because of some internal folio constraints so sometime it may happen within some shared delay okay um, uh, next feature is about um, refunding um, lost item fee when uh, item is found and uh, checking in to the library. Uh, but let's first take a look at the uh, lost item fee policy. Lost item fee policy. We have a couple of uh, properties that controls the refund uh, logic. For example, we have um, ability to disable uh, refunding of processing fee when an item is uh, is found. Uh, we can define whether we want to charge overdue uh, fine if the loan is returned, but it is overdue. And the last property uh, here, we can define some uh, time interval uh, for which we are looking uh, ref uh, refunds. And if nothing is said, uh, it means that um, uh, fees and fines uh, will be uh, refunded at any time. Okay, moving back to the low one. Uh, 
okay let's let's just take a look at the fees and fines for this loan yeah for this loan we have like uh, lost item processing fees that al already paid fully and it is closed and uh, lost item fee is partially waived then uh, part of of the amount was transferred paid and there is still some remaining amount of three and uh, if we um, check in this item we're expecting that some of the uh, uh, that fees uh, fees will be refunded and uh, remaining amount will be cancelled yeah confirm If we go back to the fees and fines, there is uh, overdue fine assignment because because uh, loan was overdue, and uh, as you can see, last item processing fee has payment status refunded fully, and uh, most interesting, last item fee has cancelled item returned uh, overall payment status. But let's just have a quick look at the fees fines action table as you can see here we have a couple of uh, new fee fine actions uh, first th these two um, about refunding of transfer transferred amount we have credit credit action and uh, refund action and the same we have for paid amount but it's just this different transaction information and the last one is about canceling uh can canceling remaining amount okay next is about the same refunding logic but uh, applicable to the lost and paid uh, items uh, the biggest challenge with such items that at the time of check-in we don't have any open uh, declared lost loan at that point uh, so in order to uh, uh, look up uh, look up uh, what should be uh, refunding, we are looking for uh, a loan that uh, was declared lost most recently. Let's just try it. Yeah, so as you can see, we have a couple of uh, fines assigned. Confirm. If we go back to the user, oops. Um, and check the fees and fines, we expecting that, uh, yeah, as you can see, um, Processing fee is refunded fully and lost item fee also refunded fully. Okay, and the uh, next couple of small improvements we have uh, applied to uh, to the case when uh, there is no uh, declared lost fee, fee and fine. For this case, uh, we close in loan just immediately, but previously we don't have had this uh, declared lost action action in the middle and yeah, now uh, we have we have one and uh, next couple improvements in inventory application we have it uh, this uh, lost and paid new status to the um, uh, item uh, status filter just let's pick some lost and paid item for example this one and since, <clears throat> since this uh, lost and paid uh, um, items uh, are not allowed to be uh, requested, we have removed a uh, new request uh, action for the, this actions menu. Um, yeah, that's actually it about our features. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thanks, Bogdan. There's a lot of logic behind those features. Okay, so lastly, we have Anton giving a QA update. Yeah, 
Now I'm not muted. So I assume you can see my screen now. Okay. Uh, so traditional uh, coverage, um, um, coverage report, list of core modules. So kudos to uh, Stripes Force by inching over the uh, uh, finish line for Stripes components. Uh, so uh, they finally got it over 80%. So congratulations. Some of the modules uh, increase code coverage. You can see I added the column um, called trend. So you can see if it changed or it's down. Most of it, some of it up. Uh, my profile just lost, lost a little bit, but still well over the threshold. So, uh, but good news about Stripe's component here. So, uh, moving on to the next next page. Uh, so, I want to talk about mo modules that don't have coverage at all. So, there are several types. There are types. Uh, there are modules that had code coverage and then disabled it. So. Uh, for those modules, you know who you are, and uh, I suggest you find time in your sprints, uh, if you're not already doing that, to uh, to enable the code coverage, and because the problems that caused you to disable it are mostly resolved, and if you don't know how to fix it, then ask me or ask Zach. Uh, and we'll point you in the right in the right direction uh, so that you can re-enable your tests. So that being said, there are some tests that um, uh, some uh, modules that uh, uh, didn't have a code coverage historically. So we kind of need to um, need to start working on it. And then there are brand new modules that don't have uh, code coverage and some of it for various reasons, but I just would like everyone to know that um, going forward, it will not be okay. So uh, that being said, uh, what will what uh, we're going to do about it? We uh, uh, resurrect UI testing team for several months, and um, we will uh, revisit our uh, uh, kind of guidelines and tool set so that we can uh, give development community uh, good rules to go by and um, uh, good information about expectations uh, on your modules so that you can plan uh, so you can plan you can uh, establish your new acceptance criteria and uh, uh, maybe even uh, kind of change your tool set because uh, uh, technology goes forward and one of the things that UI testing team will do will develop, um, well, we will need to figure out what technologies or what tools we want to use and what to keep and what to abandon. And obviously all these decisions will have to uh, weigh very, very carefully. Uh, because it will um, impact, um, uh, may have impact on the amount of work that development teams need to do. So I promise that will be very sensitive and considerate and respect all the work that has been done before, but at the same time we've been uh, under current guidelines for almost two years and uh, it's time for another iteration and that's what um, will be doing. So that being said, uh, I uh, sent invitation uh, for the um, uh, for the doodle pool and if any of you feel that you would like to contribute and be part of that and didn't get any communications from me then please reach out and I'll be more than happy to include everyone who cares about uh, UI testing into the discussion and the process, uh, process of decision making and review of the proposed solutions. So uh, that's what I have on the um, uh, UI testing and UI code coverage. So uh, 
let's move on to the next slide. So Q2 release. Uh, well, uh, I think we are being, it feels like we're being hit much harder than previous uh, bug fests uh, or previous releases with amount of defects that needs to be uh, resolved. Uh, we had, um, uh, so here I'm just showing what's open. Uh, lots of defects has been resolved already and closed, but this is what's still outstanding as we know it. And uh, I am uh, start getting little little worried that uh, the time that we have this week and next week may be not enough to fix it all. So uh, I encourage you all kind of start thinking about prioritization and kind of try to figure out what uh, what must must be fixed in Q2 uh, for Q2 release. So uh, it means that by July 10th, everything should be buttoned down. And what can be shifted into hot fix release. Uh, so uh, just, we don't want to arrive at July uh, 10th with some, with the bad news that we didn't know about uh, 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 up until that point. So the earlier warning uh, is appreciated. So kind of give it a thought and see what realistically can be done and what cannot be done. And the sooner we know, then the sooner we can make adjustments. So please uh, kind of give it a good thought, guys. Um, so now the bug fest. So the, uh, the table that I showed before that some of the defects came from the bug fest, but not all of them came from the bug fest, but all of those, all these things are right now scheduled to be fixed for Q2 2020 because release field in JIRA is set to uh, Q2 2020 for all of these defects. So with bug fest, this is the current state of bug fest test plan. Uh, we were, um, uh, uh, it, uh, we were planning to uh, test 949 test cases. It's about 150 test cases increased from the previous bug fest. So as you can see, we're almost done. And I think this blue slice is um, related to SRS um, uh, data import expert and uh, quick mark uh, tests and few little um, uh, few uh, test cases that also uh, left from other modules. Uh, so, but uh, since those uh, since the SRS was released, um, we were able to deploy it only last Friday. Then obviously testing is delayed. So hopefully by the end of July 10, this picture will look much better and we will be able to uh, retest and, and um, uh, improve our 96 failed test cases to some, get some of them to pass as well. And obviously uh, close, down, uh, close down on a number of untested test cases, which is 101 at the moment. So, but overall, uh, good progress. And as you can see, the chart looks uh, pretty green, but we still have work to do here. So it's kind of not the final report on the bug fest. It's just report on the testing that has been done up until uh, this point. So the, for the past uh, seven days. Now, this is, this is chart that shows uh, how many bugs has been found by uh, community testers. Um, actually, well, they failed 96 test cases that resulted in creation of 75 defects and few more failed test cases will need uh, bugs created for them. But it, this, as of this moment, we have 75 defects uh, three P1s, 44 P2s. Um, and the other important thing to know that not all of them need to be fixed in, uh, in this release. So out of 75, only 50 are assigned to this release. 
and they all included into that table with the red header. So you can all see that in the QA, uh, in the uh, 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 folio uh, bug statistics dashboard that's available uh, in JIRA. So as of right now, only 50 defects that has been found during Bugfest need to be fixed in, uh, uh, need to be fixed uh, before release goes out. And kind of that's all I have. So if there are any questions, Well, I guess not. Thanks for the update, Anton. Yep. All right, any other topics people would like to discuss while we're all together? Anne-Marie and I were talking about trying to use any extra time we had in, in sprint reviews to, to have discussions, but I think we'll, if, if there are no topics today, I think we'll save that for, t for another time. Everybody's busy with release activities. So um, I think we'll all be happy to have a little time back. Um, thanks again to everybody who demoed and everybody who didn't, who's been contributing to the good work that's been done. And uh, we'll see you next time. The, uh, we'll post the recording, of course, up on YouTube shortly. Thanks, everyone.